Ovo su surove strasti. First of all, thank you very much for taking my invitation to join this Croatian podcast. Yeah, I, this is your market. Yes. <laughs> I've heard Croatia is beautiful. I've yeah. never been though. You will. Uh, the first guy that introduced me to social engineering was uh, Alan Delic. Yes. Alan Delic. He came to our podcast and um, I got hooked and now <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Uh, me and Chris, we had uh, a five-day seminar. Uh, Chris was my teacher, and uh, he really liked me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do really like you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You scared me the first day you walked in, but you scared me. Yeah. The first day I walked in. So uh, today, uh, Chris, uh, we would like to go a bit deeper in the social mm-hmm. engineering. Um, so, uh, what I suggest for the other listeners is to listen to the first episode uh, mm-hmm. with Alan Delich. First of all, Chris uh, is a very famous name in the social engineering mm, context, you. right? And uh, he's famous for uh, building, creating the framework for the other social engineers. Yep. So he's the first educator that mm. uh, did this framework. And after you did it, uh, Kevin Mitnick's publisher called you, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And he said, <laughs> she, she said, I want you to write a book on the framework. And I was like, no, I'm not an author. And I said, I can't write a book. And uh, she, she, was, she tried to convince me, and I said, no, no, no. And at the time, the guy I was working with, he said, you got to call her back. Write the book, man. So I thought about it. I called her back, and I wrote that book, and now it's been 10 years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that book, that book changed my life. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, man. It, was, it started the business, you know? Yeah. So when was the first time you... you uh the term social engineer came to you came mm. to your mind that's a very good question you know when i was when i was younger phone freaking was big so i didn't really know a lot about social engineering until i got into penetration testing mm-hmm. and then when i was working with offensive security and we were doing pen tests then the term social engineering became more and more used mm. and i was like what is this so i started reading kevin mitnick's books mm. and you know looking into that and you know at the time when you'd search the internet for social engineering yeah. it was just how to pick up girls and and uh, how to get free cheeseburgers that was about it you know <laughs> I, I tried it and I, it well, works burgers or yeah girls? Well, the burgers i was married <laughs> so i had my girl <laughs> and uh what was your next step and then uh, and then i then I, I just started using things i started doing research Research, like reading Robert Cialdini's book okay. on influence, reading um, uh, Ekman's books on nonverbals, mm-hmm. reading uh, Ellen Langer's books on mindless or mindfulness. Well, mindfulness. All this uh, will be put to, into the recommendations. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, so I, so many mentioned. books I, 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 rec- I could recommend. It's unbelievable. But I just started reading and reading and reading and thinking, well, this is not about social engineering, but I can use this. And I took a negotiations course and I took a sales course. And I was like, but all of this is really good for security. Yeah. And um, and it just I don't know, it just kind of naturally happened where I'd, I'd, when we would do a pen test, I would talk with somebody and I would get their password. So and I was like, that was, was easy. Like, uh, subconscious. It was. It, it became subconscious, okay. and that's why I wrote the framework was because um, the guy I was working with, he said, you really need to think about like what you're doing and how you're doing it. And then outline it. So that's what I did. So you were like, I have this talent before, yeah. before you create yep. the framework. Yep. And I didn't understand it until I frameworked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So can you remember the first thing, uh, the first activity mm-hmm. you did to, to, to test your skills? Ooh, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, so do you, so do you mean like in, Try to get the free parking or something like oh, that. Okay. Like so, oh, okay. So, I have a great one. I would, so, and I didn't even know what was social engineering at the time, but I would get these crazy jobs okay. doing things that I had no talent doing. Like? Um, so, I was 18, and I was, I, I made surfboards for a living, right? And I did paper runs, so I did like, uh, people wanted me to deliver papers, and my dad was a, uh, was an accountant, and I delivered papers to one of his clients. And I was at this guy's office and he, he was chain smoking and he was depressed. And I was like, you know, what's going on, man? And he starts telling me about his life story. And one thing leads to another. And this guy tells me his family's in Wisconsin. He's, his marriage is in shambles. And I just actively listened to him. I just listened and I was like, oh man, I'm so sorry to hear this. And then at the end, when he was done talking, I said, you know what you should do? You should go to Wisconsin and win your family back. 
And he said, what will I do with my business? And I said, I'll run it. And he's like, you know what? That's a good idea. So it was a 25-unit apartment complex, and I became the landlord. Wow. And I was 18 years old, right? Wow. So now I'm running this apartment complex uh, as a landlord, and he calls me and he says, hey, um, I want to sell. I want to sell. I don't want to own it anymore. So I said, well, you know, pay me. I'll take a sales course, and I'll sell it for you. So I did. I took a sales course. I was 19, and I sold this apartment complex for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So your strategy was, okay, first I need the skills, yep. then I'll sell it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I always was into like learning, try, like trying and learning, and then learning and then trying, you know? So when, when you were a kid, did other kids you hang out with said, Chris has a natural talent no. for communication, for influence. No. He knows how to get things. No. When I was younger, I was not this way. I mean, I was always like pretty outgoing and I had no problem talking to strangers, but I was like a little dork and I got beat up a lot. So, and then when I was a teenager, I was pretty, pretty violent. Um, so no, I, 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 I don't think any of my young friends would have been like, Oh, he's going to grow up and be an influencer. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a shock for everybody, you know? So the breaking point was uh, that. Business. Yeah, it was that business and that hit me like, wow, I'm doing these crazy things. Like I can get a job. And then I, I came up north and I um, uh, moved up, up up north in the United States and I got a job um, working as a programmer and I had, I mean, it was just like, I need to go learn this now. And I went and learned a skill and then programmed and I did that for a couple of years and then I ran a small business of my own and then I started a computer business of my own and then I, I was a network guy and a, a security guy and then I ended up traveling to India and China and negotiating stainless steel prices. Wow. And it was... So, but you took the course and uh, negotiated yes. even more. And then I took the course. I said, if you want me to do this, I need a negotiations <laughs> course. So I went and took a negotiations course. And then, I'm, and then I took six months of Chinese lessons. Whoa. So I learned how to uh, talk to Chinese people because negotiations in China are much different. And I was flying to India and China every couple months and negotiating these million dollar deals. Wow. And then it was all kind of came down when I got started pen testing. And I was like, oh, all of this stuff that I did kind of now can funnel into this one skill and I can break into places and fish people and fish people. And it really is a weird thing because it wasn't, it wasn't like I didn't have a future plan. You yeah. know, it just happened. How old were you? Yeah. Um, so that first job, I was like 18. Yeah. And then by the time I was, um, the time I was a negotiator, I was, oh, let's see. So um, I was 30, 30, 31. Hmm. Yeah, a little older. Yeah, about 30 years old when I started being a negotiator. So, and, and it was very shortly after that that I was like, yeah, this is not my cup of tea. And I got back into security and pen testing and, and vulnerability assessments. And then it was just a quick succession from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like, yeah, maybe like a... So why not stay there? Why not uh, mm. keep the negotiation stuff yeah, and learn good. some more, work for the corporation, mm. do the million dollar deals? I got bored. Yeah. yeah, I got bored really fast. I'm one of those guys that like when I get bored, my attention span goes away. And I'm thinking, oh man, I like, and boredom for me is like when I feel like I can't learn anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know this, we've talked about this yeah. this week. And if I'm, if I'm at a place where I feel like there's no challenge or there's no way for me to learn, then I feel like, eh, you know, what am I going to do? So I, I got bored, and as soon as I felt like I accomplished everything I could accomplish and there was nothing more for me to do, I was like, no, I'm done. How did you know that you accomplished everything you could accomplish? That's a very good question. So for that job, it was um, I did all the things, and I was working, okay. and it no longer was a challenge. Okay. And I felt like, uh, so this sounds very braggy, but this is what happened. I made a deal with this steel plant in China And it was the first time an American uh, company ever negotiated with that plant. Usually it was only government agencies in China. Mm -hmm. And I negotiated a successful deal with that plant. And they wrote about me in a Chinese newspaper. Really? And now there's a Chinese magazine that did an interview with me about how I did these negotiations. And that was like a high point. But there was like, I was like, where do I go from here? And there was no more expansion. So I was like, oh, I'm bored. I go, and you weren't thinking like, okay. I did China, now I'm going to do Russia. Yeah, no, I didn't because it was just, and it wasn't what I wanted. I kind of, I, I, it was, a, I fell into it by mistake, right? Because I was, a, I was an IT guy. Yeah. I was doing uh, servers and security 
And uh, some guy was, was trying to buy a machine and they couldn't get a lower price. And I said, let me try to help. And I negotiated a lower price. And they're like, wow, you're good at this. You should negotiate this thing. And then it was like tools and machines. And then it went to, well, you're really good at this. You should go do steel. Mm. And I'm like, if I'm doing like $3 million deals, I need a negotiations course. I took the course. I went and I did it and I was good at it. And then I was like, okay, but I always loved computers and security and and, you know, it's things to do with the Internet and stuff like that. So it was always a passion of mine. Okay. So uh, do you believe that someone needs to have a talent for something hmm. or everything is learnable? I think, ooh, this is going to be controversial maybe, but I think everything's learnable. I think everything is learnable if you have the right um, motivation. Yeah, because you said, yeah. like, when I was a yeah. kid. Yeah, I wasn't this way. Yeah. Um, I think everything's learnable if you have the right motivation and the right teacher, mm. right? Because if I say, oh, I, I want to learn Croatian, but every time you try to teach me, I'm like, ah, ah, I don't do the homework, then I'm not going to learn, right? Yeah, right? I need to be motivated. So if I really say I want to learn Croatian, then when you give me homework, I got to go do it. Yeah. When you give me an assignment, I got to go do it. So um, I think when people find the right motivation, they can make any change on earth. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. So... Since you were alone in this new area, yeah. how did you practice? So, um, inter- to become a yeah. chief human hacker. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough, my own, so I had only two ways to practice. First one, every time we did a pen test, I, I got to practice, but that was not a lot. Mm-hmm. So I had to come up with exercises. So I would do things like I remember a memory exercise I would do. I would go, hey, I'm going to go to the coffee shop. And when I enter the coffee shop, I need to remember the the shirt color of the first three people I see. Okay. Right? So it would just be a simple thing. So okay. I walk in and I go, guy in olive shirt, you know, guy in black shirt, guy in white shirt. Okay. And then I would go get my coffee and and turn around and see if I can if I can remember the colors that I just had. And then once I got that and it was easy, I would be like, okay, I need to remember what they looked like, mm-hmm. the color of their shirt, and maybe what they were drinking or eating. Mm-hmm. And I would keep expanding these memory exercises. And then I would say, oh, I need to interact with one of them. I need to get their full, their full name. Then I need to get their date of birth. Then I need to find out where they work. And it just became these little goals to have conversations with people. Yeah. And that's the way I practice. Because social engineering is just a conversation. It's yeah. just a licitation. And I don't need to be malicious to do it. So I don't have to go in there and get their credit card numbers. Yeah. I just need to go. I'm going to go have a conversation with two people today and get their date of births. Yeah. For no reason. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to hack them. I'm just going to get it. That's it. Yeah. Interesting. So, hmm. Uh, can you... Uh Explain a bit uh, the difference, or, or you know what I liked about your your seminar and your mindset uh, that when people hear the term social engineer, they generally think it's something bad. Yeah, and your ethics is at a level that uh, we had we had a topic uh, manipulation versus influence. Yep. So some people don't <laughs> see the difference. Yes. But you see the difference. I do. And it's an, it's an ethical thing for yes. you, right? Yep. Can you explain it, please? Yeah, so um, I, my definition of social engineering is any act that influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. Mm. Because I don't always think it involves manipulation. And maybe the reason I, I think that's because I view manipulation and influence different. Like I view influence as... As me getting you to want to do what I want you to that's do. That's influence. Right? Yeah, that's influence. You getting me to want to do yep, something. That's right. So I want you to, um, you know, to buy my course so I get it to be your idea. Whereas manipulation would be forcing you into it, pressuring you, making you feel guilt, making you feel bad for not doing it. And then at the end, I still get what I want, but you really didn't want to do it. Okay. So I view that two different sides, and I think that as a professional... You need to know when to use both. I think sometimes okay. you have to use one or the other. But my business is focused on influence, yeah. right, on the positive side because I, w- I need to. You make- never break the law. No, right? no. I, what, so, I mean, so the things we do are not necessarily legal, but we have permission because the companies give it yeah, to us. So when, so when in, in deposits, you know, I I, I was talking uh, to other attendees uh-huh. here, and they said uh, when every hacker, probably every hacker. Uh, has some criminal history. <laughs> Chris is the only <laughs> hacker that doesn't so, have a criminal history. You know what's funny is when I was um, I was 17 or, or 18, I was in university, mm-hmm. and I was for programming, 
and um, I wrote a very simplistic war dialer. But I did a uh, war dialer, so it, I I was big in the like understanding phone freaking. Mm-hmm. So you dial a number, and when the, when the phone picks up, you dial a couple tones. Okay. But the tones would tell the phone to shut off. So it would just dial the number and then play, you know, ding ding, and then the phone just goes dead mm-hmm. for for two minutes or so. Um, and we thought it was funny, you know, you dial it, you play the tones, and the phone goes dead. Well, I wrote a program that daisy chained two modems together and called hundreds of numbers a second and played those tones and i didn't realize what i was doing and i, I shut down a whole county's phone system for a day <laughs> now you know the, the 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 college found out my professor was was really proud but it wasn't illegal right mm-hmm. so when when um you know the authorities came they went did you do this i went yeah i did it and they're like yeah you really messed things up you shouldn't do it and it was just a yeah don't do that again okay and there was no criminal charges there was nothing and then i was like ooh i need to be careful with how how, how far I go, because that could have really ruined a lot of people's lives. So even from the beginning, I never wanted to destroy things. I didn't want to, like, hack stuff and ruin people's lives. It was just curiosity. Sometimes curiosity gets you in trouble. But, you know, most of the time it was just curiosity. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, can you can you please explain why is the field uh, called social engineering? Mm-hmm. Why not social influence? Yeah, that's a good question. That's actually a really good question. I, I don't I don't remember who coined the phrase social engineering, so I didn't make it up. I don't remember who coined it. I know it got very popular with Kevin Mitnick, and it, it involved things like um, uh, the engineering, which is not thinking about like the mathematical side, but the the influencing or the manipulating or the altering of someone's social perceptions, mm-hmm. right? So that's my understanding of the definition from a security perspective of what it is. Um, and I don't know when it got popular or, or uh, how the phrase even came about, to be honest. Yeah. And what does it mean to hack someone's brain? <laughs> so, uh, for me, that, that's a, that means um, uh, amygdala hijacking is what I focus on. So, creating a situation where someone's emotions um, disable their logic centers from mm-hmm. making rational decisions. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to scare the heck out of them. You or just need to influence that's them. That's it. You just need to influence <laughs> them. That's it. Just influence them enough that emotional overload shuts down logic, and that's mm-hmm. it. And then when you do that, you interject your request at that point. Mm-hmm. See, so if you just do that, that's that's not hacking. If you if you make them emotional and then you walk away, okay, no, no big deal. But if you make them emotional and at that point you interject your command or your request... That's the hacking portion. If you think of it like a like a remote shell, okay. you know, I send you a program, and when you click it, it injects code into your machine and gives me access. So this is I I present emotions to you, yeah. and then when they when they when they start up, when you click them, it I inject the command, and yeah. then you're more likely to to go forward with the command when you feel emotional than when you don't. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, well, how does it work in practice? Like a uh, company. Uh, hires you and can you give, yeah. give us some kind of an example so uh, co- like how, co- you, how you hack into the system or yeah. people yeah. so um, we have a couple different ways that's done so let's say in a, in a, in a hacking way uh, companies will hire us to do a penetration test but instead of just net, you know doing computers we actually go to the building mm. and we try to break in or we send phishing emails to the employees or we call them on the phone and we get their passwords and then we log into their computers um, so we do the social engineering side of hacking to try to gain access to the network. Mm-hmm. And then we tell them how we did it so they can fix it like a normal pen test. Um, but there's also companies that hire us to do like phishing only. So maybe we fish their employees every month and we're collecting stats, um, statistics on how many clicks we get and how many times they reported it and other things like that to help their company see where they need to improve. Okay, so you're like... Um doing something like Google AdWords, right? But yeah. uh, we're tar- targeting the companies yeah. to yeah. buy something yes. you know, to, to get hooked. Yes, right? yeah. So what's the job that uh, you, you're you most proud of? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I would say... Except well, of this seminar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, so, so the training for me is probably my most enjoyable part of, of my work because I get to connect. Like this week we had 21 people in the classroom... Mm-hmm. And I got to connect with each person in a different way. 
I mean, some is super positive, some not so much, but I still connect with so many people. And then some of them, like we had those two guys in the class this week, that they made such a drastic change in five days. Mm. I mean, they come in day one and they're sitting and they're not looking around and they're, they're low, low self esteem and their body language is closed. And then day five, they're standing tall, their chest is out, they're talking to complete strangers and it's five days. Yeah. And I go, wow, like I never planned in my life that my training could do that to a person in five days. So that, that makes me feel good. Like people leave here and they're like, they don't care if they're going to go be a hacker. They're like, you just changed my, the way I communicate with people. And that feels really nice yeah. to be able to have that influence. You know, you do that. So, you know, it like feels good when you alter someone's perception and then they feel better for having met you. Yeah. So I'd say that's probably the, the thing I'm the most, I'm the most proud of is my, is my training. And a professional yeah. part, uh, yeah. those, uh, when someone hires you. Yeah. 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 Um, so on a, on a client side, yeah. uh, I have one client that I, I, I've been working with now for, for almost eight years. And, uh, they went from, um, they went, they went from 71%, um, click ratio on fish mm -hmm. to actually, after only five years of working with them, to have a, a 79% reduction an actual malware on their network. Okay. And that, that was due to our program and that felt really good. This was a massive company that, that all of a sudden started seeing less, um, malware attacks mm -hmm. on their network because of the work we were doing. I mean, we were saving people from being breached. We were saving a company from being hacked. And I was like, that felt, that was a really big pride moment for me. That felt really good, you know, to be able to sit back and say, we did that. So that that's you know those I'm proud of those moments with my with my business. Yeah. So, um, do do you enjoy writing books? Mm. That's a funny question. So my and what is the goal? Yeah. So my first book was forced, right? Okay. I, I didn't want to do it, but I did it, and I'm kind of glad I did it now because it was a good experience. My um. My second book, I really wanted to write it. I wanted to because I got to write the book with Dr. Ekman. Yeah. And it was a, it was a, it was a I'm life. I'm asking the social engineer. Yeah. The yeah, I'm asking the social engineer. I wrote with Paul Ekman and it was a life altering experience and it was wonderful. And I, I, I wanted to do that. And my third book, um, it's not that I, I wanted to write it, but I needed to because it's all about fishing. Mm -hmm. And what we saw was like every month there was a new SaaS popping up about fishing this, fishing that, fishing this, but nobody knew how to do it right. So they were just clicking on templates and sending templates out and it was bad. So we, we, Michelle and I wrote the book, uh, so that way we could tell people, here's how you fish properly. Here's the psychology of it. Um, and then my fourth book is probably where I turned into an author. I really wanted to write that book. Um, I felt that that book was uh, necessary for me to write because it was um, it was the time of my career where I could take these eight years of experience, put them on paper, and give them to people to make a change. And and I, I feel really good about that book. Yeah. So that one's the uh, science of human hacking, yeah. social engineering, the science of human hacking, and I'm just really proud of that book. But. I feel finally like I'm actually an author now. Yeah. Um, so the question was, do I enjoy it? Uh, you know, it's always a painstaking process. Yeah, because, because we're not so detailed. Yeah. Guys. Yes. That's the D's. <laughs> that's so detailed. And I'm always worried about like putting it out there and that people hate it or something. Yeah. But um, I do. I do enjoy it when I get to to write like what I did with this last book. Uh, do you feel like? Uh, mm, do you feel bad when you get a negative review? Oh, that's a good one too. I used to. So when I wrote my first book, I remember going on Amazon every day. Yeah, but you don't have it. <laughs> you can't do anymore. Yeah, yeah. So you can't yeah. Have it. <laughs> and I would go and I would just refresh the page and I would read. Oh man, no, someone really hates it, right? Um, and after that, I remember somebody saying, look, you can't read all the reviews because there's always people who are going to hate you and there's always people who are going to love you. And then I realized that sometimes people's reviews are not even about the book. Like, I saw some bad reviews and they were like, Amazon sent me a wet book, I hate them. One star. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, that's my, not about my book. Like, that's a one star review because Amazon stunk, you yeah. know? Um, or I, one guy wrote a review, I hate Chris, he's a fat slob. 
Look, that's not about my book. It's about me. Yeah. You don't like me as a person. Not, it's not about the book. Um, so I stopped reading the reviews. And now what I do is um, I read them sometimes. And if someone says something really great, I thank them. And I focus on the, on the positive ones, you know. And if someone's really negative and they have a couple points that are good, I may write to them and say, hey, can you explain more? Mm-hmm. You know, why is it so bad? Um, but yeah, they don't. So you interact with them. I try. Engage, I try. Engage. Yeah, on Goodreads or Amazon or other places yeah. where they let you post, I'll try to interact with reviewers to let me know like what I can do to be better or improve mm-hmm. or things like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what is the formula for becoming a good mm-hmm. social engineer? Um, the formula. Does the person have to be from the IT? Oh no, I don't think so. I think, I think the person has to be either good at speaking with other people or willing to learn it. Okay. And, I, and I, for me, like when I look to hire someone, it's not so much about technical skill as much as it is um, being a people person, mm-hmm. willing to do things that are uncomfortable. That's mm-hmm. a big deal. Right? I mean, you know this. All week you were yeah. here, and many of the students would freak out about the homework. Yeah, you know my comment yeah, was, yeah. was like uh, that this could be like a personal development center. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't have to be like the social engineering. Yeah. Like. And, and that, that's what I, I feel is like you have to be willing to, to do that, mm. to have that kind of a, an attitude about the things you're going to do. And when you have that attitude, then I think you can make it in this career. Technical skill is nice, but if you're like me and have a team, like Ryan on my team is very technical. I used to be very technical. I'm not so much anymore. Ryan is very technical. So with my team is so strong that if I need a technical person, I'm like, Ryan, help me out. Yeah. And then he does the technical stuff and we work well together. Um, so I, I think, you know, you don't need to have those skills to be in this industry. I think you just need to be willing to really be uncomfortable for a while. For a while, like a day? <laughs> Man, maybe longer. Um, Or every day. It may be every day for certain things. Like, I'll, g- I'll give you an example. With Ryan, uh, he really gets nervous vishing. Now he's a, is a, uh, the phone, a phone call. call now, he does amazing at it. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he does 100% whenever he does it. But he gets really nervous doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that he'll never be comfortable with it. He'll be uncomfortable with it for his whole life. But... It doesn't stop him from doing it. Yeah. He still does it 100%. Yeah. Have you ever seen a change from someone who was nervous and became a god? Yeah, yeah. I have. Ryan is an example. Mm. Um, when I first met him, literally the first day I met him, he was a student. He didn't work for me. He came in the classroom. He sat in the back of the class and he did this. Mm. And I went, oh, why is he here? Like I thought to myself, what is he doing here? Because this class is not for someone who's timid and and shy. So I went up back and I introduced myself. And he said, I'm Ryan. And he was really quiet. And I was, I was just thinking to myself, I wonder if his boss made him come, you know? Mm. So first day, comes, he goes and does the homework. He comes back. He does amazing. And I talk to him and I say, hey, why are you here? You know, what are you doing? Because you look really uncomfortable. And he said, I wanted to come because I wanted to improve. Now, that was my first big thing. I was like, yes, this is the kind of person. And uh, that was four years, five years ago. And now he is the lead social engineer in my company. So, yeah, that's a huge change. How many social engineers are there in the company? Uh, right now, we only have 11 people. So mm-hmm. we're pretty small. Uh, only 11 people in the company. Um, but, you know, well, I, I grow slow because... Um, I don't take every job that comes. I turn work away sometimes. Why? Um, What is the reason for turning the job? A couple reasons. One, one reason I will turn it away is if a company uh, doesn't want to agree to not fire people. Company needs to agree that... They're not going to fire. They're not going to fire. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's some reasons why we would, of course, f- um, fold on that. Like, you know, you, you, you're going to fire them because they're doing illegal things. Fine. Okay. You know, you're firing them because they're stealing your data. Great. You're firing them because they're downloading pornography. Fine. But if someone just falls from my phishing email and you fire them and you replace them with another human, that human is just as vulnerable. Yeah. So don't fire people for... You know, falling for social engineering. So there are companies, there are companies that are strictly saying, I want you to tell me who, who I need to fire. Yes. And that's not what I do. I'm all about education. So Why are you so nice? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. But I, I don't know. I guess, I guess I think that, um, 
when when I started off in this industry, I feel like sometimes the IT guy, you know, we get this name like we think everyone else is stupid because we understand computers. And I always hated that mentality. And I think that you can't make a change in people if you are a jerk to them. You know, if I walked in the class and I was like, listen, all you are stupid and I'm really smart. I mean, who's going to listen to that? You know, who, who's, who wants to listen to that? And if you're like, I'm, I'm better than all of you and I know it and you're just going to listen to me. Man, you want to pay for that? You know, so I think about that all the time. And yet we do that with like our staff. You know, not us, but like, like companies will, uh, their staff will click on phishing emails and they want to shame them. Shame doesn't work. You know, gratitude works, but shame doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's better to praise the good ones and train the bad ones mm -hmm. than it is to shame the bad ones and do nothing for the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, like, that's really nice for me. Yeah, thank you. You know, but I think that you're, uh, by doing that, uh, I think uh, there are, there's a potential of creating a lot of uh, competition. <laughs> I, yes. Yeah, we have more competition. So, Five years ago, nobody was doing what we're doing. Very, I think there were two or three companies. There was not many people. And now there's dozens of companies saying they do social engineering. Have you trained um, them? Uh, some of them. Some of them have come to my classes and some of them have gone to my competitions like at DEF CON. Mm -hmm. So we have some people who've come to DEF CON, won the social engineering competition, mm -hmm. and then they go and start a business. Uh, and I'm, I'm fine with competition, uh, but that's why we issued the code of ethics. We talked about that yeah. in class. Yeah. We have a whole code of ethics just for social engineers. And we issued that because we wanted the people who are competing with us to hold to a very strict code of ethics. So they're not just out, you know, making people feel bad and, you know, treating people poorly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was that. Yeah. I, I don't mind competition personally. I think it's okay. Okay. Do you respect the competitor there that, um, uh does something that's manipulative if a company that hires uh, him or the company, um, you know, asks, asks him or her to do it? Yeah, so if, if a company says, like, we've done it, company says, we need you, we've, worked, we've trained with, with you, we've worked with you, we've tried all the influence and they're really good, mm -hmm. can you now try some manipulation? Yes. So if one of my competitors does manipulation and it's in that scenario, yes, I would respect them. Yeah. And as long as when they're done, the way that they treat their clients, right? So think about this. You're on a pen test and you're live tweeting, oh man, this company's so stupid. I just broke in with a, with a cheap lock pick. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not naming the company. But your client is sitting there mm. and they're reading your Twitter and now they're embarrassed. Yeah. I see this all the time in my industry. People will live tweet their tests and they're saying negative things about their clients and it feels bad. Can you imagine if during class I was tweeting things like, oh, you should see this student. He screwed up so bad last night. He's so dumb. Now, I didn't say any name, but one of the students reads my Twitter and goes, oh, is he me? Mm. And now they all come and feel bad. I, you know, I think when you, I, I don't respect that. So when my competitors do that, I don't respect them. Yeah, but you, uh, you said, not but, you said uh, you have a client for, you have clients for many years. Yeah. So you're like the, the, the master of rapport. Yeah, I try. Aren't you? <laughs> Aren't you? I try. Well, we have some clients, you know, that work with us for now eight, nine years. We've been with, with one or two of our clients. And that always feels good because, you know, we're able to, to look at our clients and say, yeah, you stuck with us because we have a relationship. We're actually friends. It's not just, you know, we're not just, you're not just giving me money. We actually are, you know, friends, friends with each other, which feels good. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, can you spot a potential in a person and you can say, mm. like, this person is, has a strong potential to mm. become a social engineer? I, I think I can, but not just like looking at them. Okay. For me, it's more about students, mm -hmm. right? So when I see mm -hmm. students through the week, mm -hmm. I look at people who I think will make great changes in their life. And then I can see people who could be great social engineers. And then I see people who think they will be good, but probably not unless they make some changes. What are the traits of the mm -hmm. fantastic social engineer? Uh, the first one that comes to mind is humility, right? That's the first one that comes to mind because... Uh, the, when you start thinking, there's nothing else for me to learn, right? I've learned everything I can, and I'm. Uh, then I feel that you've 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 hit a pinnacle where in your brain you're stopping, you're stopping the ability to to expand. So I look for people who are humble. 
Uh, that, that's the first thing. And then the second is the willingness to try. So when I see a student that is humble and yet they're willing to go out and try anything, mm-hmm. I say that person's got, got the, they may have the ability. Okay. You know, and then the third is motivation. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we have a lot of students in this class that I think can do amazing things in their future, but they're not going to go be social engineers. That this course may change their life in other ways, but they're not going to be SEs. But then I, there's a few where you're like, ooh, they're going to go, and they're going to be amazing at this job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are the qualities that someone uh, can develop to be uh, more successful in social engineering? Um, I think, um, so the stuff that we talk about, like rapport and elicitation and influence, um, those skill sets, I think are very important for you to have a good mastery over, uh, if you're going to be in, if you're going to be in this field. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, as far as skills go, that would be ones I would say to focus on. Um, I I think nonverbals are a big thing. Of course, I'm, as you know, I'm huge into that. Uh, but then I think on the on the softer skills, like the wet skills, the wetware skills, I think it's more about just understanding how to communicate with people, understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are, and then understanding um, um, that need to be able to step out of your comfort zone and do it for a better cause. What about intelligence? I think intelligence is important. I, I think critical thinking is more important than intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, there's many people in my company. Is there you know, critical thinking without intelligence or intelligence without critical Ooh, thinking? Oof. That's a very good question. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 I want to say, ooh, that's a good question. I think you can be intelligent, but not a critical thinker. Okay. Right? So I know a lot of people that are really smart. I mean, man, they have like book knowledge. They can do math. They can program anything. But they can't figure out the simplest critical thinking problem. Mm. You know, like just how to communicate, how to not argue, how to not be combative. Um, but I think that critical thinking could be present whether you're super smart or not. You think? I do. I feel, I feel like you can because I feel like... Can you imagine what, what you need to, to develop uh, the critical thinking? Yeah, I, I think it's empathy. Okay. Uh, first of all, because critical thinking to me, now let me def- you know, what I think about critical thinking is that it's the ability to look at a situation and figure out multiple paths to completion, mm-hmm. right? And then choosing the best one for you in that situation. Or like uh, having uh, a lots of options, options for yes. the same thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. So that to me is cr- like people who can't critically think are f- narrow focused. Yeah. So I need to get there. There's only one way for me to do it, and that's through all these tables. Mm-hmm. You know, but I go, oh, wait, I need to get there. I can go this way. I can go that way. I can go that way. I can go under. I can go over. Yeah. And now I say, what's the best option for me? You know, how do I do get there and not hurt myself and not hurt anybody else? And that to me is critical thinking. Okay. And um, I think people can do that when you're not intelligent. Uh, and when I say that, I don't mean you, like you're, you're dumb, but I don't think you need to be super smart to do that. I think sometimes people who are really, really intelligent um, lack critical thinking because they rely on their intelligence so much. Mm. They think, I'm really smart, I can figure this stuff out. Uh, but they're missing the point of that empathetic response that is so important okay. to find those paths. How do you feel when you fail? Oh, uh, so of course I'm very disappointed when I fail. Um, What does that mean? Like you're, um, you're going to the hills and no, you're not uh, going home for three weeks. No, no, no. So jumping I, in uh, no, in cold water. no, no. <laughs> I, I guess it depends on what, how much the fail is. You know. Um, um, I feel bad about myself, of course, but but I always look at every failure as an opportunity to learn. So, like just recently, I messed up pretty big on something. Um, I had I had um, I had opened up a private chat to a public area by mistake uh, for a very short period of time. I fixed it very fast, but it was a, it was a big opsec fail on my part. I had a private chat and I and I opened it up without thinking and it was a complete mistake and I embarrassed a couple of people. Mm-hmm. And you know all I can do I felt horrible but I just apologized over and over I owned it I didn't make any excuses. I came right back and said it was 100% me, no one else's fault. I'm the one who messed up and I just said, you know, I'm so sorry if anything bad happens I'll take the blame, you know, and it was over quickly. Everyone forgave me and it was 
you know, back to normal. So it's uh, humility, uh, humbleness, and, yeah. and uh, honesty. I think so. Yeah. I think that would be the right equation when you mess up because, you know, when someone messes up and then you're like, well, it wasn't really my fault. You know, uh, Sasha made me do it. Mm. Well, now everyone's like, well, what do you mean? I, I saw you mess up. Mm. And, and that lack of humility makes people not want to forgive you. Right. And then if you're not honest about it, if you're like, well, I didn't really do it. Someone else kind of did it, but I'm taking the blame. When people find that out, they can't trust you. Yeah. And the, the nature of forgiveness is, is rapport and trust. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like if you mess up and you view it as a learning opportunity, you, you, you're honest and you're humble. At the same time, it still feels bad. Yeah. I felt pretty bad for like two days about that, you know, until everyone started forgiving me. I felt pretty bad because it was a mess up, you know, and I embarrassed a couple of people and fortunately nobody got hurt over it, but it was pretty embarrassing. You know, when when I was younger, <laughs> I thought social engineer, I was studying behavioral uh, disorders, <laughs> you know, and I thought social something, social engineers, that's something that would be suitable for psychopaths. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, and you really are uh, extremely emotional guy. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah. So, comment on that? Yeah, that, that's Can a Can you good... spot a, a, a psychopath in the class? No, you know, here's the interesting part is um, this, I, this discussion actually came up on Twitter. Is that, is it easier to be a social engineer if you're a psychopath? And I think the answer is no. Because if you look at the greatest con men through or through the through time, they had empathy. Yeah, they were the friendliest people. They were happy. They they were your buddies. I mean, you look at like um, uh, Frank Abagnale. Yeah. You know, he was charismatic. Yeah. You know, he was he was amazing when you when you thought about him. Um, and you look at some of the greatest people through history who were con men. They were they had this ability to make you feel like you were their best friend. Yeah. Oh man, and so I think a psychopath doesn't do that because they lack empathy. Mm-hmm. Psychopath lacks the ability to feel for you. So I, I feel like being a psychopath is not a benefit to a social engineer. Now, with that said, um, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a, like a human, um, personality detector. So if someone comes in the class and they're not honest or they're not empathetic, I can pick that out, but I don't necessarily know if they're sociopathic or psychopathic off the bat. You know, okay. have you had, have you ever had the regret on uh, any person you've ever trained? Yeah, a yeah. few, not not a lot. It's like literally a very small handful of people, but there have been a couple of people that uh, through the years that I wish I can go back and say you shouldn't come to this class, mm-hmm. and not because I felt they're psychopaths or anything, but I feel mm-hmm. like um, they lacked that humility to grow. And now these skills may be in the hands of someone who um, doesn't see the way they should be used properly. You know, so I've had that. What's the proper way to use these skills? Well, I think if you're not a social engineer, the best way to use these skills is to learn how to enhance yourself to be a better communicator, not to change anyone else. Right. So I look at most of the stuff that we talked about this week about ways to make me a better communicator with other people. Mm. Um, if you're a social engineer, the proper way to use it is to figure out a way to start a company that's ethical and, and moral and, and honest. Um, but when people come and they, they are arrogant or they're not good team players or they're argumentative, and I don't mean just debating, which is healthy. You know, we did a few, few times during class, and that's healthy. I think that that is that you need to have that. If someone sits there all week and never asks a question or yeah. argues a point, that that I don't like that. Uh, but we're talking combative for the sake of being combative. Um, those kind of people, I feel like they they uh, they may leave the class and they may use the skills in a manipulative way, and then not help people but hurt them. Yeah. Yeah. I understand, Chris. Yeah. I understand. And I totally agree. Yeah, you see, there we are. <laughs> so, uh, what's your biggest fear? Great. Ooh, you're now using the homework on me, huh? Um, and what's your social security? Uh, yes, I'm not giving you that. <laughs> well, that's a good question. You know, I think, um, I think, uh, if I had to classify my biggest fear, uh, personally, would be to do something that, um, uh, that hurts my family. That would be my biggest fear, you know. Uh, something that that would make my kids not trust me or hurt my wife and I don't you know I don't have any plans for that but people make mistakes and that's my biggest fear 
uh, or just make them not respect me. You know, do something in, in work or life that my kids stop respecting me. But in a business sense, I think my biggest fear is, is make, is not, um, not thinking clearly through the business so I can't support the people that are working with me. You know, when I hire someone, I take it really seriously and we have a great team. Um, so for me, my biggest fear with business is always just making sure that, that we stay the way we are as a company, super positive, um, you know, super great and amazing at the job, but also growing a little bit so my people can stay employed. Because I feel like if my company failed tomorrow, I can get a job anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I, you know, and I think my people could too, but I always fear, you know, like if I'm not, if we're not running this, you know, I would hate the other families to be hurt because my company didn't do the right thing. So like we mess up as a company, my internal philosophy, we always do this. We've messed up a few times too, is we own it. We call the client and we say, we messed up. Here's the things we did, and here's how we want to fix it. Are you okay with this? And I've had clients literally come back and, and thank me, even though we messed up big time. Thank me because we were honest about it, and then we offered to fix it, and and they stayed with us even after the mess-ups wow. because of that. So I feel like that's like a great path forward. And my fear is someday, you know, not following that path. Yeah. So. I, the, my next question was, I want you to just imagine in your mind, like, last 20 years uh-huh. and if you look back yeah what would you really really regret that you didn't do Ooh. wow what would I really really regret now that's a really great question um, right now I work too much <laughs> you know I run a real company after a fake five company. days of the seminar yeah. we're doing yeah. the podcast yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 I have a business a fake business and a foundation <laughs> and uh, sometimes I regret BFF yeah yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, the, I, the ILF <laughs> and I, uh, I sometimes um, I sometimes think about I, I don't want to ever have a regret that I didn't spend more time with my kids growing up so that's why I keep them involved Like, you know, my daughter came and helped us with the homework, and I try to keep my family involved with my business, so that way, if I am busy, I still feel like we're we're together as a family. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, regrets are always about personal things, not about business things. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, my my business life is good, and, and I, I have no regrets there, so... Um, I don't, I can't think of anything besides that that I would look okay. back in 20 years. Yeah. Okay, what's your mission? My mission. Your personal mission. Yeah, my personal mission. Um, you know, these, when I started this company, I never ever envisioned that, uh, two things, that my skills would be used for something like saving kids from predators, which we're doing with the ILF. Wow, that's like. And, and I never envisioned that my training would be used to alter lives like it has. So my mission is to keep doing that and making it better, right? To keep growing. Like, you know, when we, at the end of the class, when we ask people to write out their surveys, I don't want them to just tell me, oh, you're the best. I want them to tell me where we can improve because those improvement measurements help me see what I need to change to keep making this class better and better and better. Um, so I, you know, I, I feel like when I looked When I looked forward, you know, 10 years ago, I never thought that this would occur. So my mission now is to, is to grow the ILF so we have tons of people helping save kids and that my courses keep expanding and helping more people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, would you by any chance uh, change your profession? Ooh. I, I honestly can't think of what I would do besides this. I... I can't imagine. I can't say no to that because to me there's never an absolute in anything. Mm-hmm. I think you need to be open-minded to everything. Mm-hmm. You know, would there be like what if the what if this industry collapsed? Somebody created Or what if uh, this industry uh, got, uh, got, got worse? Right. You know, like manipulated. Mm, yeah. yeah. And what, so, I think <laughs> we can still control how we how we work, but I figure like you know, what if someone came out with a piece of AI that stopped phishing as a threat. Social engineers can no longer attack companies. Um, yeah, I would have to change my profession. Um, but willingly? Oh, man. I don't know. I love what I do. I wake up every day and I don't look at it as work. I, like, I go to my company. I work with people I enjoy. I work with clients I enjoy. 
I get to do things that change lives and and save people. That feels great. Yeah. You know, it's almost like being a little mini superhero. So uh, I don't, I, I wouldn't, I can't imagine changing that. I wouldn't yeah. say mini. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not too many. <laughs> I'm a big superhero. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice, man. Nice. So, um, you have like a vision. You want to expand this. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's, what's the direction you're heading to? Uh, I don't ever want to be too big. Right. I think uh, the reason that our team works so well together is because we're close knit like a family. Mm -hmm. And I think if you get like a hundred, two hundred, a thousand people, you become an organization, mm -hmm. not a, a family size company. So I would I, I could see for for my for a social engineer um, LLC, I could see that being like, you know, 20 people. That feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then for the ILF, I could see that growing. I could see that being huge. Um, if, if we can make it because to me, the more people we have working on that, uh, the better it will be for us in, in saving kids. Okay. So I think, um, it's just two different visions, but, uh, for different reasons. Okay. Yeah. If you had like, um, a power hmm. to take one book and put it in your hand like uh, 20 years ago. Ooh, wow. One book and put it in my hand 20 years yeah, ago. Like yeah. Create the magic and take a book and put it through the back to the future. Yeah, and yeah. To the past then. No, oh, because I, I have like two or three in my mind. Give us three. Okay. So the first thing that came to my mind when you said that was influenced by Robert Cialdini. Mm -hmm. Because I, like, for me, that's a book that I use every day in my, in my profession. Mm -hmm. And, and I found, I find that book to just be fascinating and wonderful, right? Um, the next book I think about is, um, is Dr. Ekman's Emotions Revealed. Mm -hmm. Because he's, he was doing that research back then, but he wasn't writing books like he was now, you know? So I think, man, if I was, if I was that young and I was able to read that book and change how I communicate, who knows where I would be today? Um, and then, and then the, the third is, um, Robin Dreeks, what, um, 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 the top 10 ways to build a poor with anyone fast. Mm -hmm. And you influenced his book, right? Yeah, I did. But I love that book because it's so quick and actionable to read. And I feel like you can, you can pop that book open to any page. You can read something and you can go out and make someone's life better. And I'm like, that is powerful. Uh, those three books come to mind when you ask if I would, if I would, Go back, you know, when I was and when I was much younger. If someone handed me those, I'd be like, "These are life altering." Great. Yeah. Chris, thank you for it. No problem. I know you were exhausted. Ah, it's okay. But I didn't mind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs>